Bibles, uh, Acts chapter, not Acts, Exodus chapter 9. That's what happens when you're in the book of Acts for two years. It just, it's hard to get it out. We're going to be in Exodus for five years, so I don't know what, what we're going to do at that point. But um, something that we have to really consider when it comes to the, the Exodus and Moses and the plagues and Pharaoh, and maybe something we've never thought about, I just want to kind of touch on momentarily, is the fact that God is unraveling creation to get Pharaoh's attention. If you think about this, uh, it's right in line with Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, if you're not familiar with Spurgeon, amazing uh, preacher, lived in the 1800s, first mega church ever, metropolitan church there in, uh, in London. Uh, but Spurgeon said this, and I want you to think about what he's saying here. When it pleases God by his judgments to humble men, he is never at a loss for means. He can use lions or lice, famine or flies. In the armory of God, there are weapons of every kind from the stars in their courses down to the caterpillars in their host. Stop and think about that for a moment. God, being the Lord over creation, can use whatever he needs to to get our attention. And this is exactly what we see in the plagues. And perhaps what is more uh, striking with these plagues is the fact of what I just said to you about... When God is trying to get our attention, he sometimes unravels order. He brings chaos in order to get our attention. So what we see in the plagues is this creation that is heading back into this dark, chaotic state. Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 says, And the world was formless and void. Right? The universe was formless and void. So God is taking what he has created in this order, and he now makes it all fall apart. Why? Because he has to sometimes unmake us to rebuild us. So for Pharaoh, he's listening to Moses. They've already gone through, we've already gone through six plagues. There's ten total. All around Pharaoh, the very fabric of his world is falling apart, disintegrating into chaos, darkness, and death. And Egypt is now a picture of life in meltdown under God's judgment. And isn't it amazing to consider the lengths to which God will go to to get our attention? Why? Because there's one goal. He wants you to know that there is no one like him. Right? That should, that should humble us. That should uh, cause us to stop on our tracks and go, what have I been doing? How have I been living? Who have I been worshiping? See, God wants you to know that there is no one like him. Turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 9. Let's, let's pick up this theme and, and look at this, this last cycle of plagues before we get to the 10th plague. So as you know, uh, we've already been through six plagues. Uh, and even my wife last night was like, are we done with the plagues yet? She, sometimes, you know, sometimes we're just getting ready for bed. And she's like, are we talking about more plagues tomorrow? And I said, here's the good news, babe. Right? Like, we're not taking one plague a week, right? We're moving through this rather quickly. You know me. Like, I'd be like, let's take one plague a week. But we've been doing cycles of three. We're on the last cycle of three. And then we're going to deal with the 10th plague on its own, which is the most severe, most horrific. And that is the plague of the death of the firstborn. So today, the plagues we get to talk about are the, 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 the hail, the locusts, and the darkness. So turn there. We're going to cover quite a bit of ground this morning because I don't want you, like my wife, to be discouraged like we're talking about more plagues again, right? So, um, but these are the hardest ones coming. The first six are, are mere nuisances compared to these next four. Uh, it's because Pharaoh continues to be resistant to what God wants. And the more resistance, the more God has to be a little bit more louder. He has to be a little bit more intense. And so here we pick up the, the account in chapter 9. We'll start at verse 13. And I want you to just start and think about our, our discussion with this, this topic of God's declared purpose. And I've been trying to do this with each of the plagues, is that there's a reason why God has designed these plagues. There's maybe some introductory reflection we should have. So today it's a declared purpose, and he mentions it in verses three, 13 through 17. Acts, uh, Exodus 9, verse 13 through 17. So the Lord said to Moses, 
Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say to him, so again, this is just like every beginning first plague of the cycle of three, he, they meet Pharaoh at the Nile in the morning. Thus says the Lord, the God of Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. So the message hasn't changed. Pharaoh, they're not your people, they're my people, and they've been designed for freedom to worship. There's the goal. Verse 14, for this time I will send all my plagues on you. So now we have this change in the narrative that says God is saving the most intense cycle for right now. And that phrase on you in your Bible literally is against your heart. So God has an aim that says, Pharaoh, perhaps you've been resistant up to this point, but these next cycle of plagues is going to strike you so deep within, it's going to hurt. I am aiming to get your heart and your servants and your people so that you may know there is no one like me in all the earth. Verse 15, for if ha by now I had put forth my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, you would have been cut off from the earth. Meaning, I could have ended this thing with one plague, but I'm giving you 10. He doesn't say that. God knows there's 10. Pharaoh doesn't know how many are coming. But isn't it amazing that God, while he's a God of judgment, he's also a God of mercy. Verse 16, for indeed, for this cause I have allowed you to remain. Even the wicked can glorify God in their presence on earth. Even their schemes and their deceit can be used for God's glory. Crazy, huh? So this reason I allow you to remain, look what God says, to show you my power and in order to proclaim my name through all the earth, still you exalt yourself against my people by not letting them go. So let's just stop and think about these four verse, few verses here. There's three declared purposes that God does not want us to forget that are so important that it would be helpful just for some quick reflection on them. Number one, God's unique presence. There is no one like me. There is no one like the Lord. There is no one like our God. Pharaoh thought he was God. Pharaoh thought he existed to be revered and adored and worshipped. And God is saying there is only one. You are not designed to worship the creation. You are designed to worship the creator, Romans chapter 1. And so here is God saying, there's no one like me, so let's redirect our hearts. The reason I am sending forth these plagues is that you have been designed not to worship the creation, but worship me, the creator. Number two, there's also God's universal praise, that his fame will be known throughout the universe. That God has so done what he's done in these, these, these plagues and in, in Egypt that he has shown mercy, he has shown patience so that he can be worshipped around the world. A, a series of ten plagues is enough to, to excite anyone's attention. As a matter of fact, if you read the book of Joshua and you go into Samuel, there are nations that come to Israel and say, we've heard about your God. We've heard about what he did in Egypt and to the Egyptians and with the plagues. And all of a sudden now there's this reputation of God that is going all across the planet. And the word of this, this God is being spread among the surrounding nations. Why? Because everything God does is designed to make him famous, for him to be glorified. And so, the last thing is that there's God's unlimited power. So not only is he unique that there's no one like him, not only is, is he designed human beings to worship him, and one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Philippians chapter 2. Some will worship him voluntarily, and some will worship him involuntarily. Meaning every knee will bow, some of it will do it out of worship, and some will do it out of regret and judgment. Number three, God's universal power. Look what he's, he does here. He says, I have authority over my creation. If I want the flies to come in and invade your life, I can do that. If I want the heat to bear down upon you, Arizonans, I can do that. <laughs> Hot week this week, right? And I'm wearing jeans. I shouldn't be wearing jeans right now, but I'm wearing jeans. I'm going golfing tomorrow in the afternoon. Pray for me. I may not make it back. They, I may be one of those statistics, like we drug another body off the golf course. That might be me. But here we see God's unlimited authority over all creation. That there's no one who holds the power like the power that our God holds. 
But think about how these three things are also displayed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Think about how these things are reflected in the cross and resurrection of Jesus. Can we just stop and go, wow, in the cross we see God's power over sin and death. We see the good news of what Jesus has done spread around the world so that where his name is praised in all the earth, because that's the goal, to get people to stop praising things of this world and start praising the, the God who is sovereign over all. All right, now let's get into the next cycle of plagues. Seven, eight, nine. We're going to talk about a storm, locusts, and darkness. The message continues. Verse 18. Behold, about this time tomorrow, I will send a very heavy hail. God is the most accurate weatherman in the world. Let's just be honest, right? Tomorrow, big hail is going to fall. Big hail is going to fall. In a region where, do you know what the average rainfall in Egypt is? Less than three inches a year. This is a dry and arid space. The fact that there would be heavy hail, there would be lightning, there would be rain, there would be thunder, this is just unheard of. And here comes plague number seven. God says, I'm going to bring hail such as not been seen in Egypt from the day that it was founded until now. You know how long that is? 1,700 years. About 3500 B.C., Egypt had started as a nation. This is about 1800 B.C., 1700 years. I can do my math. I went to public school. God says this has never happened. Now, therefore, send, bring your livestock and whatever you have in the field to safety. Every man and beast that is found in the field that is not brought home, when the hail comes down, they will die. So not only is God this amazing weatherman saying exactly what's going to happen when, he's giving them a heads-up warning. How good is this? God is not only merciful, but he's patient and he's compassionate. You have 24 hours. If you don't bring your stuff inside and in shelter, you will die. The first instance of any human life being taken in all the plagues. This is getting intense. Verse, seven, verse 20. The one among the servants of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord made his servants and his livestock flee into the houses. So stop right there. Look at verse 20. This now tells us that some of the Egyptians are starting to go, Pharaoh is not God. The God of Moses is the true God. Even those who were unbelieving are starting to believe. How do we know this? Because they somehow feared the word of the Lord. And they did what God had told them to do. Whoa. But verse 21 but he who paid no regard to the word of the Lord left his servants and his livestock in the field. What did God say would happen? If you don't obey his command, you will die. Now the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand towards the sky that hail may fall on the land of Egypt, on man and on beast, on every plant of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched out his staff towards the sky and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire rained down on the earth. So this is just more than just hail. This is fire, this is thunder, this is rain, this is a destructive storm that is now falling upon the land. And the hail struck all that was in the fields throughout the land of Egypt, both man and beast. The hail struck every plant of the field and shattered every tree of the field. Total destruction. Only in the land of Goshen, where the sons of Israel were, there was no hail. So again, God spares his people. So here's God, the weatherman, saying, heavy hail in Egypt, but clear sunny skies in, in Goshen, right? Think about it. Egypt is looking and seeing no devastation among the people of God. Let's just stop and consider something real quick. Point number two on our outline, this destructive storm. The first thing I want us to think about are the admonitions from God's external word. Here's what we know God has spoken with Moses, with Aaron. Here's what I want you to share with Pharaoh. This didn't come from them. This is the word of the Lord. And just so you know, with the word of the Lord, you're going to get one of two responses. There's no middle ground. There's either reception of God's word or there's rejection of God's word. God's word is given to us so that we respond to it positively because apart from his word, there is no wisdom. Apart from God's word, there is no truth. 
Apart from God's word, there is no knowledge, ultimately, which is best for our lives. I think we would generally agree with that. This is why we affirm the words of Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3. All scripture is God's breath, inspired by God, given to us for teaching, correction, reproof, and training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be equipped for every good work. But we also know that Hebrews says the word of God is like that scalpel, that sword that's able to divide joint and marrow, soul and spirit, does a work on us like nothing else in the world. So what we have to understand is that there's this external word of God that is not to be altered, not to be minimized, not to be tweaked, not to be added to, not to be subtracted from. His word is liberty. His word is life. His word is freedom. The choice is now on you. What will you do with his word? As a communicator, I have no control over how your hearts are going to respond to the word. I hope and pray that you would respond favorably to it, but I can't, I can't control that. As a, as a communicator, I can generally give you the message, but you as a person that's creating God's image with this ability to digest and process what's being said, you're ultimately either going to act on it or you're going to reject it. Think about what, is, what the Egyptians did. They were starting to, by plague number seven, this is the amazing thing, right? It only took seven plagues to get their attention. How many plagues has it taken you to get, for God to get your attention? Are you not glad for his patience in your life? Some of you, it's like seven plagues. Some of you, it's like 70 times seven plagues, right? But here's the good news is that God, while he's a God of judgment, is a God of mercy. There's a day that's too late to receive God's mercy. But as long as it is called today, today can be the day of salvation. Ladies and gentlemen, God's word is to be received, but because our hearts want what our hearts want, there's many people that reject God's word. And when you reject God's word, there's nothing but devastation. There's nothing but destruction. There's nothing but death. Where are you to go for the words of eternal life, Jesus says to Peter. They're with me, Peter. Without me, you will die. But with me, you will find freedom and life. Can I ask you guys, do you know this? Do you know this today? That when we receive God's word, that it is not only to be embraced by faith, but it is to be acted on by obedience. See, this is the proper response to God's word, that we respond to God's word with two things, faith and obedience. Write those two words down. Because it's not faith without obedience, and it's not obedience without faith. You know what faith without obedience is? That's called licentiousness. And obedience without faith is called legalism. And both are destructive to your lives. We embrace by faith what God has given to us, trusting that he knows what's best for me, then I know that what's best for myself. And I act upon what God has said. James chapter 1 says, Who of you have been pre- presented with the word of God's truth, and like a person looking in the mirror, walks away and forgets what they've seen, so is the same person who hears the word of God and chooses to do what they want rather than what God wants. There is no freedom apart from obedience. Only when we obey God can we truly enjoy his blessings. This is a matter of my heart. This is a matter of your hearts. Because the heart that is not set on his word becomes dead set against his will. So the rejection of God's word means that somehow I think my gods are still going to save me. The gods of my bank account, the gods of my health, the gods of my happy marriage, the gods of my obedient children, the gods of my amazing driving skills on the 101 during rush hour, whatever your God may be, whatever you're propping up and saying, this is in which I find life, this is in which I find significance, this is in which I find value, how easy it is for God to take those things away to show us that there is no one like him. 
The Egyptians are still trusting their gods. And if you haven't f- heard this yet, I've become an expert in the Egyptian gods over the past couple weeks. There's 80 plus deities. The deities that are being attacked in this moment with the hail would be the gods of Shu, who is the god of the atmosphere, Newt, the god of the sky, Tilnut, the goddess of moisture. Boy, we could really use that god today in our, our, our climate. Set, the god of wind and storm. These gods are being destroyed because there's no one like our god. And God says, because I am a God to be revered and a God like anything else, you are to fear my word. Because if you don't fear my word, you're ignoring my word. And there's no fear of the Lord when you ignore God's word. Verse 30 in in chapter 9 is the first instance of the fear of the Lord phrase in the entire Bible. You were designed to fear the Lord. Proverbs 1 verse 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge and wisdom. Right? And to fear God means we are to be in, we're to live in reverence before Him, in awe before Him, that there's no one like our God. So He sends this hailstorm like they've never seen before. Notice Pharaoh, he breaks, he calls for Moses. And he, and he gives a confession because of this plague. Look at verse 27. Then Pharaoh says for Moses and Aaron says to them, I have sinned this time. Oh my goodness, we're getting some traction. I have sinned this time and that the Lord is the righteous one and I and my people are the wicked ones. So we stop right there and go, oh, Moses, now Pharaoh's saved. He's converted. And I sit there and go, hold on. Because while we would want to celebrate with someone who says, I'm saved, I'm changed, I'm different, sometimes we need to pump the pedal a little bit and go, what's going on here? Because actually Moses challenges this. Look at what it says. It says, make supplication to the Lord. So Pharaoh is saying to Moses, pray for me. For there has been enough of God's voice, God's thunder and hail, that I will let you go and you shall uh, stay here no longer. And Moses says to God, Or to Pharaoh, um, as soon as I go out of the city, I'm going to spread out my hands and pray. And the thunder's going to cease and the hail's going to cease. But I want you to know that I'm praying that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But as for you and your servants, here's what here it is, ready? I know that you do not yet fear the Lord of the Lord God. Somehow I know you're playing games. Somehow I know you're being duplicitous. Look at verse 31. Flax, barley were ruined, but the barley was in the ear and the flax was in the bud. Sounds like a country western song. I don't know. But the wheat and the smelt were ruined. Were not ruined for they ripen late. That, I think that is Moses' way of saying the next plague is going to take care of whatever vegetation was left. So Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh, spread out his hands to the Lord, and the thunder and the rain ceased, and the rain no longer poured on the earth. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had stopped, he sinned again and hardened his heart, he and his servants. Was his confession genuine? No. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not let the sons of Israel go, just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. So while there are admonitions from God's external word, right, where you either have one of two decisions, either I receive it or I reject it, what we see now are attitudes or approaches to God's internal work. So let's look at Pharaoh's heart because I'm going to assume that Pharaoh's heart may not be unlike my own heart. How many times have I given a confession that wasn't sincere? How many times have I given a, a, a confession that wasn't genuine? Because there's two words at play that we need to talk about that the Bible addresses seriously. Remorse, repentance. They are not the same. Pharaoh is displaying remorse. What Pharaoh is not showing is repentance. Remorse condemns. Repentance freeze. Let's talk about this. Remorse is worldly sorrow that seeks to avert consequences. Slap my hand. Oh no, I'm stealing from the cookie jar. Why do I feel guilty? Because you discovered me. I do not feel guilty because my mom clearly said, these are not for you. They're for your Aunt Helene. Save them for her. Right? I'm guilty because I was discovered. 
Repentance is godly sorrow that desires to embrace conviction. This is so important to nail down this morning that we're going to just spend a few minutes on this. Because here's what God does internally is he challenges us. What are you feeling right now? Because what you're feeling is the weight of your sin, but what are you going to blame? Are you going to blame all your circumstances and situations and people and this? Or are you going to look at your own heart and say, woe is me because I'm a sinner? Remorse deals with the externals, the peripherals. It doesn't deal with the heart. It only wants to avoid the consequences. Remorse says, I broke God's rules. Repentance says, I broke God's heart. Write that down. I stole that from Tim Keller, and then Tim Keller stole it from somebody else. So, a bunch of pastors who are thieves. Yep, welcome to our company. Remorse says, I broke God's rules. Repentance says, I broke God's heart. Do you hear the difference in those two statements? Because a confession that acknowledges sin without fearing God is a false confession that falls short of true repentance. We are not to minimize our sin. We are not called to not recognize the depth of our depravity. We're to go to those dark places and hate not just the consequences of sin, but more hate the condition of my heart that produces this stuff. Right? The heart is deceitful, Jeremiah 17 says. Who can understand it? And the Son has come into the world to expose these things in our hearts. And what do we do in John chapter 3? We find the darkest rock, the biggest rock we can hide under because we don't want to be exposed. But here's the good news or the bad news, however you want to take it. God knows. When it play, you can't play hide and seek with God and win. He, he'll find you and he'll show you these things. And he never exposes you to condemn you. He exposes you to free you. He wants to break you. Ooh, I'm, I'm getting a little groove right now. Some Japanese harpsichord music. Speaking of the Japanese, the Japanese have an art form called kintsugi. And if you're not familiar with it, it's not only a great death cab for cutie album, but it's also a, a Japanese art form. So what they do is they take this incredibly expensive piece of porcelain and they will break it. And then they'll take all the pieces and they'll meticulously glue it all back together and they sell it because it is more valuable broken than it was whole. Boy, that sounds like the gospel of Jesus Christ. That says, until I break you, you will never know how valuable you are to me, God says. So ladies and gentlemen, you have a God who is showing you mercy today who says, I know everything about you and things you don't even know about yourself, and I'm still extending my hand of mercy toward you. Enjoy freedom in Christ today. Let me break you so I can remake you. Let me hurt you so I can heal you. This is the message of the gospel. It's not remorse. It's repentance. Remorse hates the consequences of sin without ever learning to hate sin itself. See, what we have to understand about repentance is that there's no ultimate relief without genuine repentance. And oftentimes, repentance is not clearly seen until after we confess our sins. This is why sometimes we, we, we should celebrate with somebody, but then we should wait to see what is the fruit of that repentance look like. Because sometimes people don't understand repentance. They, they embrace remorse. We do remorse well. But when it comes to biblical repentance, that change of heart that produces a total change of life, that's what biblical repentance is. It's not what you say, it's what's lived out. 
Pharaoh didn't want to change a heart. You know what Pharaoh wanted? God to get off his back. I mean, seriously, right? It's like, what do I need to do to get God to leave me alone? He's not alone in that testimony. Proverbs 28, verse 13 um, says this. And here's the question. Do you want to conceal or do you want to confess? He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Wow. And to make matters worse for this whole situation, they're seeing people across the land not being destroyed. And this is probably why some of them have said, we better start learning to take this God at his word. But Pharaoh, he continued to harden his heart. And not only that, God hardened his heart. It's probably one of the most mysterious phrases in the, in the word. Uh, it's something we've dealt with before. Let me just touch on it once again so that we're clear. In hardening Pharaoh's heart, God allowed him to have what he sinfully desired. And this is what God does. God does not create fresh evil in the heart of innocent people. We are sinful people deserving of God's wrath and justice. What God doesn't do is he doesn't have to put evil in a heart where evil already exists. All God must do to harden anyone's heart is to withhold his grace, and that is to give that person over to themselves. They don't want God. They want what they want, and God says, I will let you have what you want. But he doesn't have to work evil in a heart that already has evil present. But Pharaoh hardened his heart. So guess what? Plague number eight. Here we go. A devastating swarm. Bugs! Can I tell you right now? I have, a, I have a thing about flying insects, not just because I wear a tire. I should have a shirt for every plague of the Bible. I wish there was one. Especially the boils one. What would that look like? People walk around with like growths all around. I mean, it would be kind of cool. People would be like, what the heck is on your shirt? Boils. Today, I just have flying insects, flying bees, right? But here's the thing. When we first moved to Arizona, um, we uh, were living in North Phoenix, and um, these cicadas started flying around. And, you know, anything that flies and makes a buzzing, like, like you get a little bit. I was seven years old, and a cicada flew. And my first reaction was when nothing flew in my ear, I smashed it inside my ear. And you know what my mom did for like the next half hour? Took tweezers and was pulling out dead cicada out of my ear. So that was, outside my sister's poopy diaper outside of Blythe is that incident. And that just really set the stage for everything that would be. Uh, I was dating a girl in high school. Um, uh, she lived with her mom, single mom. And uh, uh, they lived in this townhouse and they had a cockroach. And so being there at the time, being the man, I'm like, oh, I'll take care of this cockroach, right? And I went to approach it with a broom to get rid of it, and the thing took off and started flying. I started screaming like a nine-year-old schoolgirl, right? So um, I don't like flying bugs. I don't like flying insects whatsoever. Um, but, this, but what I experience compared to what they're going to experience is nothing. Look at this. Chapter 10, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, and, and, and I've hardened his heart and the heart of the servants, that I may perform these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell. So interesting note, verse 2, that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your grandson how I made a mockery of the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. So stop right there. I love how there's this little note that says, Part of what God does in making himself famous is so that you as his people might have a story to tell. And if you think about it, what an epic adventure. I mean, can you imagine the kids sitting down being like, uh, it's story time, and they go, all right, so let me tell you about this guy named Joseph who was totally rejected by his brothers. They threw him into a pit. They decided, why should we let him die? Let's make some money off this guy's life. They sold him into slavery. The slave trade brought him down to Egypt, and in Egypt he rose the ranks of political power so much so that he was able during a season of famine to rescue his people. He brings the people of Israel into Egypt where they exist in prosperity. They're multiplying. They're being fruitful. They're doing everything God wants them to do. 
do. But all of a sudden, there's a Pharaoh that rose to power who knew not Joseph. And all of a sudden, he turned against the people of, Egypt, of Israel because they were multiplying like, 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 like rabbits, right? And he was getting a little concerned about his power. So he said, death to all the newborn boys in, in, of Israelites. And all of a sudden, God spared one guy named Moses out of that whole thing. And for, thir- for 40 years, he existed in Pharaoh's house until he s- tried to take God's plan into his own plans. And he was rejected. He ran away into the wilderness. And all of a sudden, God raises up this 80-year-old guy. Imagine Joe Biden stepping in to try to rescue your life. That's essentially what it is. He's this octogenarian who says, I'm going to go back to Egypt under God's direction and command and rescue my people. And boy, how he's going to rescue the people's son grandson, let me tell you how God does it. He does it with blood. He does it with lice. He does it with frogs. He does it with mice. No, this is not a rhyme, right? He, he does it through all these spectacular things. And can you imagine the kids are sitting there going, what? Tell me more. Because this is the amazing story of God's deliverance that answers all the big questions that every single child, every single grandchild has always considered. Think about the big questions of life. Who am I? Where am I from? What am I here for? Where am I going? What is my purpose? Is there a God? How do I know this God? What does this God want in my life? Those are the big questions that the Exodus answers. And not only that, these are the questions that the gospel answers. That you have been created in the image of God for life, not death, for freedom, not captivity. And only through the cross and resurrection of Christ is there truly a message to tell. The fact that my family, who were militant atheists and agnostics, did not know Jesus until some neighbors reached out to my mom and dad in their 30s, and my mom and dad surrendered their lives to Jesus, leaving a teenager punk named Scott Morgan in the house who thought I was going to be the next guitarist for ACDC, but instead had a ministry call in my life, and a brother who was 12 and a sister who was 9 who all surrendered their lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And now my kids sit and said, Dad, tell us. Tell us. And I still share share stories. And when they're in church, they're like, Dad, how come you've never told us that before? Because if I told you of all the amazing ways God has allowed me to have this spiritual adventure in Jesus Christ, we would be here till eternity. Well, that's not a bad idea. Let's stay here till eternity and tell one another the stories. Is it not amazing what God has done? Not just among the Israelites and not just among Moses, but among us who were once blind, but now we who were once deaf, but now we, and once we were once dead, but now we are alive. God is working his work in us so that not only would we just know that there's no one like our God, but that we would have a story to tell. And when people hear our story, they are captivated, they are moved, they are astonished. And there's real astonishment when God saves a punk like me. You should see the people that were at the church where God saved me. They're like, boy, if there's anyone that we thought was far from the grace of God, it was you, Scott Morgan. <laughs> and here I am. Still question among a lot of people. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But think about this. There's a quantifiable testimony that you and I have that goes beyond mere feelings, mere subjectivism, There's an objective reality of when God has touched our lives and transformed our hearts for his glory and for our good that we can share with our kids and tell them that the big questions of life are answered in Christ and that there's no question that's worthy of any conversation that's not answered in him. Without Christ, there is darkness. Without Christ, there is ignorance. Without Christ, there is no sense of direction. There's no sense of worth. There's no sense of purpose. That in Christ... We know who we are. We know where we came from. We know where we're going. We know what is important. We know what is the meaning of life. We know that there's a God. We know how we can know him. And we know what he wants us to do. And he wants us to love him and honor him and glorify him and hold him in reverence and tell the world there's no one like him. Do you have a story to tell? Share it. Share it with everybody. Because that's quantifiable testimony. Secondly, we see this qualified obedience. So check this out, verse 3. And Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, and I love this. How long, Moses says to Pharaoh, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before God? Let my people go that they may serve me. Now this guy's come a long way from the burning bush. Would you not agree with that? 
this guy was like, I can't speak, I can't share, I, can't, I stutter, I'm little, little. and all of a sudden now he's confronting the most powerful man in the world, and he's saying, how come you're so prideful? Humble yourself before the Lord Almighty. God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the, if you don't humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, you will be humiliated by the mighty hand of God. Humble or humiliation, your choice. Pharaoh, how come you have not humbled yourself? For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I'm going to bring locusts into your territory. I'll talk about locusts here in a moment. <laughs> and they shall cover the surface of the land that no one will be able to see the land. They're gonna be, there's going to be a carpet of bugs so dark, so thick, so ravenous. Every step you take, it's going to be crunchy. They're, they're hard on the outside, but creamy in the middle. That's all I've heard about locusts, right? Because some people eat them. Remember John the Baptist? Locusts and honey. Oh, he's a little bit crazy, but we'll, get, we'll talk about that some other time. Then your houses will be filled, verse 6, and the houses of your servants and the houses of the Egyptians, something which neither your fathers or grandfathers have ever seen from that day until now. Pharaoh's servants said to him, now the servants of Pharaoh question Pharaoh indirectly. Look what they say. How long will this man be a snare to us? Now I want you to see something. Let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not realize that G Egypt is being destroyed? So now not only is Moses the voice of reason, now his own servants are saying, Pharaoh, do you think we've had enough? And what they're saying to Pharaoh is, would you please come to a point where you concede defeat? You think there's humility in this man's heart? Pride. Pride will lead a man to destroy his marriage, his kids, even at higher levels, destroy a country. Moses says there in verse 8, they're brought back to Pharaoh, and he says to them, Go serve the Lord your God. Who are the ones that you're going to go with? So now there's a third question, and Pharaoh presents it, and it just shows you his, his lack of desiring to do what God wants him to do. Qualified obedience. You know what that means? He thinks he's going to bargain with God. Tell you what. Who's going on this trip? Because I'm going to tell you right now that I'll let the men go, but you need to leave everyone else beside. Moses, not compromising. Look what he says in verse 9. We're going to go with our young and our old, our sons and our daughters, our flocks and our herds, and we're going to go, and we must hold this feast to the Lord so he basically says to Pharaoh, we're taking everyone and everything. You have no control over this, what God has commanded. See, ladies and gentlemen, when God speaks, he speaks in such a way where it's an all or none command. How many of us think still that we can bargain with God? Like he's open for discussion. You know what God doesn't do? He doesn't discuss. You know what God does do? He dictates. This is what I demand. And as God being creator, because again, we think God somehow must be our equal. Oh, I can, I can debate. I can bargain. God is your creator. He is your sovereign. He is your Lord. And there is no bargaining. There's only bending your knee in humility before him and say, what you will that I will do. It's all or none. God's not a God who says, you know what? Imagine how many people came to Jesus and they said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Remember the rich young ruler? And he just rattled off this, his resume that looked so impressive. And Jesus said, looks pretty good. Now just go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And he started crying and walked away. Jesus didn't go, oh, wait, 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 wait. I didn't mean to make you upset. Come back. Maybe we can talk about this. Jesus is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And if he says there's an idol issue going on in your heart and you need to separate yourself from the thing that is really God and not the true God, you better do it. God does not discuss. God dictates and demands and says it's all or nothing. Pharaoh doesn't understand this. So God sends forth the locusts. 
Let's see a picture of a locust. In case you guys forgot what a locust looks like, some of you are like, I don't know what a locust looks like. Well, here's a picture of one. They are about two to three inches in length. They are ravenous grasshoppers, essentially. They can eat their body weight and more in a day. They travel in formations. We'll call them swarms. The book of Joel, if you've never read Joel in the Old Testament, three chapters, check it out. God says, the locusts are my army to do my bidding. And the locusts will destroy everything you've depended on, but I will, as your God, restore that which the locusts have eaten. So there's the hurting, there's the healing with God, right? So these locusts, if you go to the next, uh, they travel and it looks like a storm. Matter of fact, the United States, someone first service told me they just went to Indiana and they've had a locust plague there the, the past couple months. And people have said the noise is so deafening that they're having a hard time sleeping at night. It sounds like a thunderstorm when the swarms of locusts come in. These things travel... Just to give you the, the size, a 10 square foot area can contain 10,000 locusts. Blanketing, darkening, blacking, blotting out the sun. Testimony has shown that there are these swarms of locust invasions that have happened on the continent of Africa. They can happen in Central Asia, they can happen in Africa, they can happen in Midwest America. But the last major one that happened about 50 years ago in the continent of Africa took out a region two times the size of the United States. 200 million locusts condensed within an area in a matter of three months destroyed 5 million square miles of land. That ain't nothing compared to what Egypt will experience. Think about this. The gods of the Egyptians that are failing them once again. Men, the god of crops. Isis, the goddess of life. Nepri, the god of grain. Anubis, the guardian of the fields. Senehem, the divine protector against pest. And what's Pharaoh's response? Will it be humility or will it be humiliation? Check this out. Verse... Uh, 12, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand that they may come up out of the land and, the, and they'll eat every plant of the land over all, uh, all the stuff that the hail left. So the hail destroyed a lot, but it didn't destroy everything. So what's going to destroy the rest? The locusts. So Moses stretched out his staff over the land and the Lord directed an east wind called a Scirocco, my very first car, thank you very much, to come out out of the east to carry the locusts. So now not only is God the Lord of the locusts, he's the Lord of the wind brings this incredible swarm of locusts into Egypt and they settle and destroy the land and the locusts came up over all the land of Egypt, settled in all the territory of Egypt and they were very numerous. There had never been so many locusts nor would there be so many again. Verse 15, for they covered the surface of the whole land and the land was darkened and they ate every plant of the land and all the fruit of the trees and the hail that was left, the, all that the hail had left, nothing green was left on the tree or the plants of the field all throughout the land of Egypt. And then the Pharaoh hurriedly called for Moses, and he said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Second verse, same as the first, you think? Now, let me just tell you, his theology is right. When we do sin, we do sin against God, and we do sin against one another. But look what happens next. Now, therefore, please forgive my sin only this once. When God can heals you, when God frees you, is when you have full confession of all sins. He's not going to save you from one circumstance. He's going to save you from the entire condition of your heart. Make supplication to the Lord your God that he would only remove this death from me. Again, very selfish, self-centered. Remorse is very self-centered. And he went out from Pharaoh and made supplication to the Lord. And the Lord shifted the wind to a very strong west wind, which took up the locusts and drove them into the Red Sea. Not one locust was left in all the territory of Egypt. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the sons of Israel go. So again, questionable brokenness, yes. He not only recognized his sin, he not only requested forgiveness, But the true test was the fact that he only wanted practical expediency rather than deep spiritual conviction. And you know what this is called? Manipulation. To feign one thing only to manipulate the circumstances to get what you want. 
Pharaoh's a master at this. Which leads us to our last plague, and we'll close with this. There's this dreadful darkness. God sends the ninth plague unannounced. So if you remember the cycle, nine plagues, three, 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 first, fourth, seventh, always are met with Pharaoh at the Nile in the morning, given warning. Number two, five, and eight, he's met in his home or his palace and confronted one-on-one in that space. And then the third the sixth and the ninth always come unannounced. Look what happens, verse one, uh, verse 21 of chapter 10. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the sky that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even a darkness which may be felt. Circle that phrase. I don't know if you've ever experienced an environment where there's total darkness, but it is haunting. I've done this thing called spelunking. Anyone ever been spelunking? Anyone know what spelunking is? It's cave exploring. And there's no other place I've ever been than a cave when you turn off all the lights that is just more haunting than that. Down in Pepper Sauce Canyon, down near Tucson, my Tucson contingent right over here. Yeah, go, oh Pueblo. Down Pepper Sauce, you ever been to Pepper Sauce Canyon? You know where it is, there's a campground there, but if you go across the highway, there's this hole, you climb in, and then all of a sudden, you're about 15, 20 feet in, and there's no light whatsoever, unless you bring the light with you. And talk about bumping your head, talk about running into people, talking about just having no, it's very disorienting. And that's nothing compared to what these people are experiencing as far as what they feel. So Moses stretched out his hand towards the sky, and there was this thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They did not see one another. So dark you cannot see the person in front of you. Nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. They were confined within their homes. But all the sons of Israel had light in their dwellings. Then Pharaoh called Moses and said, Go serve the Lord, only let your flocks and your herds be detained. Meaning, I'm still in control. I hate what we're going through, but I still want to retain control. So go ahead, take your families, but leave your livestock. And Moses is like, I'm not budging. There's no compromise here. Therefore, our livestock are going to go with us. We need, we need animals to sacrifice. This is our property. Until we arrive there, we ourselves do not know what we shall do to serve the Lord. And the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, verse 27, and he was not willing to let them go. Then Pharaoh said to him, Get away from me. Beware. Do not see my face again. For in the day you see my face again, you're going to die. And then Moses says, You are right. I shall never see your face again. And with those words, we prepare to enter the last and final plague, the death of the firstborn. But let's just stop and consider something real quick. This darkness was deeply unsettling. This darkness was a total deep darkness that would cause sensory deprivation, leading to disorientation, leading to psychological distress. There is a sense of doom that pervades the minds of people that are not only placed within dark places for for moments and for maybe minutes or hours, but for days, they're essentially trapped in their homes until the plague ended. And God somehow didn't even allow artificial lights to work. Somehow they couldn't even light a torch or couldn't even light a candle. But Israel was able to. But there they were in darkness The gods that they worshipped related to light are are being attacked and defeated. Horus, the god of sunrise. Haten, the god of midday sun. Atum, the god of the sunset. But the most supreme god in Egypt, God saves his best work for last. Ra. You ever heard Ra? The sun god. It's terrifying because they worshipped the sun. Now they had no controller of the sun. And for three days, their sun god in their estimation, has been defeated. The sunset represented death. The sunrise offered the hope of resurrection. Here's what they would tell their children, Egyptian religion. Ra was thought to sail through the celestial sea in a boat. And at night he would descend into the netherworld before rising victorious again with the dawn. But during the ninth plague, he did not rise. Those three days of darkness were a clear sign that he had been defeated. 
What you need to understand about darkness is the Bible says darkness is error, ignorance, sin, rebellion, death, which are all opposed to God. And I can't help but to think how much of our rejection of God is based upon visual stimuli. Think about this. If God closes off all my ability to observe and perceive and I'm only left with the ability to look within because I cannot see anything without, there's some issues I need to look at and focus on and be, and be thinking about. What's the last thing we want to do is think about our hearts. What's the last thing we want to do is, is have things exposed that we know we need to deal with. Think about the fact that you looked at yourself in the mirror today and evaluated your life based upon what you saw. Think about on the way here, you thought about how much you had or didn't have based upon the, the car of the person driving next to you. Or you come in this morning thinking about, oh, look how nice they're dressed. Or look how, you know, look what they're having to drink. or what. All of a sudden now, every bit of estimation, value, purpose, significance that is visually fed to us is gone. And now we can only think about and look at what's in our hearts. That's a deep darkness. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 19 says this. The way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. But here's the problem. Even with sight, we don't really see. Even though we live seemingly in light, we still are grossly ignorant. We're destructive. And so what's the... What's, What's the remedy? Can I give you four things this morning about light that will, will, will help us? Because Pharaoh suffered not just from physical darkness, he suffered from spiritual darkness. But I believe today is the day of salvation. I believe today is the day for us to confess and repent and begin a new course for our journey. Four things. Number one, we have the light of God's presence. When Jesus came on the scene, was he not the life and light of all people? But let me just tell you, knowing Jesus externally and accepting him internally are two different things. This is why 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, John would write these words. This is the message we have heard from him, who is the light of the world, and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Before I tell you six ways to improve your marriage, I cannot neglect to encourage you. First, know the Lord your God and know that with him there is no one like him. This is not about behavior modification. This is not moral therapy. This is the fact that we are invited into God's presence and that is only available and accessible through the personal work of Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world. In him there is no darkness at all. It starts with the relationship. Secondly, there's the light of God's principles or promises. You choose. This is a choose-your-own-adventure P word, Okay? Meaning, there is no light apart from the Word of God. God's external Word is to be accepted. This is why we tend to hide from God's Word because we hate what it exposes. But we don't know that God's Word of light leads to freedom, not condemnation. For those who welcome it, who receive it. This is why we find the, the passage to be so important in John chapter 8, verse 12. Jesus says this uh, as he's teaching about the, the parable of the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. If you're not walking with Christ, if you're not heeding his counsel, if you're not listening to his words, you're in darkness. You're in blindness. Because apart from him, there is no eternal life. Apart from him, there's no wisdom. There's no light. And so what we have to understand is he gives us the principles. The word of God is the light. Your word is a lamp unto my feet, the psalmist would say. But it's not just 
important to have principles. It's important to have priorities. Number three, the light of God's priorities, meaning once I receive the principles, how are they prioritized in my life? If it's not God first and everything else a far second, I'm not prioritizing God. I'm not going to walk in the light. First Peter chapter 2. Do we have that passage, Davey? Awesome. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for my own possession, right? God says, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Your identity, your instruction now dictates the way you live my life and the way I want you to live your life every day is for my glory. Make it your ambition to please him. But if he is not your obsession, you will live in darkness. And the last point is this. We get to be a community of light together. We, we can't do this without one another, church. Right? The light of God's people, the fact that we get to center our, our hopes around the light of God's word. We get to center our hope around the person who is the light of the world, Jesus Christ. The fact that we are no longer in darkness. We are a community of light. He is transitioned us out of the dominion of darkness to now live in the kingdom of his light. Is that not good? And now we rejoice according with Paul, according to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. Paul says these words, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Oh, what a cool, cool thing to do. What does it mean to love the light? What does it mean to walk in the light? What does it mean to fellowship with those in the light? What it means is that there is no command we will not keep. There is no sin we will not forsake. There is no duty we will not perform. There is no talent we will not employ in our ambition to give all the glory to God. And all God's people said, let me close with this. I know it's a great pastor moment when he says, the pastor says, we're going to close with this five times. I've already told you we're going to close. This darkness for three days that's set over the land of Egypt is no comparison to the darkness that existed for three hours on a place called Golgotha some 2,000 years ago. If you think about the darkest of all days, there was a day that was darkened unnaturally as a man hung dying on a cross. At the cross, the plagues of our sin fell upon him. The judgment and wrath of God fell upon Christ and our sins were also placed upon him. And if you remember what I started this sermon with today, it was this. God is uncreating the world to recreate it. God is unraveling creation and it looks like he's descending things into chaos, but he's bringing it to a point where he can remake it once again. There is no unraveling, no unmaking, no uncreation like the cross of Jesus Christ. Think about what Jesus endured for us. At the cross, the maker came to be unmade so that we can be remade. The son was unraveled under the judgment of the father. He experienced chaos, darkness, and death. And here lies the most ultimate moment of uncreation. And his uncreation led to recreation as the dead came back to life. Ladies and gentlemen, we do not worship a lifeless, hopeless um, motionless Savior, but we worship Him who is not only the life, but the resurrection. And the resurrection of Christ is the promise to us that there is a God who is looking to recreate us. In Christ is the beginning of all recreation. It's the promise of our recreation. For Christ has already absorbed the plagues of God's judgment. And now God's mercy is for all those who come to Him for deliverance. Believer, rejoice that he has taken your judgment and you have received his mercy. Rejoice that you have been delivered, that you've been set upon a solid ground, brought up out of the pit, and he's put a new song in your mouth that says, there is no one like the Lord. Believer, let us rejoice in that. But if you're here today and you do not yet believe, make today the day of repentance. Make today the day of brokenness. Make today the day where God destroys you in order to rebuild you. He's got to crush you before he can consecrate you and make you into the person he wants you to be. Stop bargaining with God and bend your knee today and know that with him there is salvation because salvation can be found no where else? 
And all God's people said, man, there's no better message to tell than that. And sorry I channeled my Baptist preacher at that last moment there. I love you guys. I'm super excited to journey as children of light with you, with the light of the world, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. We know we deserve worse, and yet you sent your son to take that worse. We know that you've demonstrated your love towards us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ dies for us. Wow. May the, may the reminder of that truth cause us to praise you once again because it's your kindness that has led us to repentance. And it's your kindness that still leads us to repentance today. How good you are, oh God. Forgive us for the ways we've minimized sin. Forgive us for the ways we've tried to do things on our own. Forgive us for the ways of trying to live our lives apart from you. We are desperate for you, O oh God. Thank you for today. Thank you for the message. Thank you for your spirit that works. Thank you for your truth that not only reveals, but it restores. Lord, thank you for being so good to us. Be glorified in our lives, now and forever. Direct our steps today and forever. Lord, thank you for being such a, a God that our testimony is this. There's no one like you. May we be quick to share that message with all people. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen. Love you guys. See you soon. Enjoy your day. And we'll see you soon.